for recording. Uh, and hello to, <laughs> to the people who are here on site. Uh, this is uh, really a pleasure to be here and, and to, to present the work of Utrecht Data School. Uh, I spoke with Albert prior to this lecture about what we could do best, but what would be the most uh, appropriate to, to do. Uh, so we thought it might be handy to first introduce the Utrecht Data School as we moved towards the uh, science faculty now. And uh, as I became uh, a member of uh, this department of ICS, and to explain who are we, what are we actually doing, and what is the way we work, and uh, our focus is often a little bit different. So I use today's lecture to introduce the work we do at the Utrecht Data School and how we work. And if there are other occasions at other times where we can zoom in on one or two other research projects, we will do that in future. But for today, we just wanted to introduce what we are doing at Utrecht Data School and give an insight to the range of projects that we're having there. Also in the call uh, might be my colleague Karin van Es, who's the humanities lead uh, at Utrecht Data School. And uh, she's also participating in joint projects with colleagues from ICS, uh, in particular in a project on recommender systems and values. So what do we do at the Utrecht Data School? The Data School is a research and teaching platform that focuses on teaching students digital methods and data analysis. Mostly the students are from the humanities faculty, but our courses are also visited from uh, students from, from the uh, STEM subjects, uh, STEM disciplines who are interested in the social questions around data practices and who want to learn more about application in real life. Uh, we are basically interested in, as, as humanities researchers, social scientists, we are interested in the impact of datafication and algorithmization on citizenship and democracy. And under datafication, we understand the structural transformation of any everyday activities or transactions into machine readable information and algorithmization, the increasing implementation of automatized decision making processes in all kinds of, uh, in, in practically all levels of public management or the media sphere. I'm going into those two areas of interest in a minute. We developed in our work with Utrecht Data School three premises that really drive our work there. And the first premise is we want to be where the change, technological and social change manifests. We want to be where the action is within social sectors. Um, we want to connect teaching and research. So we take our students to the field. Working with us as a student is mostly being on a field trip. And we take the students to various companies, uh, municipalities or ministries, and they work hands on on projects that we find within the field. And lastly, we want that our research has not only academic impact or helps the students to find great learning opportunities and uh, career perspectives, but also societal impact. We really want that our work makes a difference and that we can see uh, social change. Uh, I speak also about that. We have two main research areas that I already indicated. We are interested in artificial intelligence and social values. So we look uh, at uh, technology as something that is not neutral, but that embeds and carries values and can change values, can transform values. The second research area we are interested in is public debates in the platform society. And the platform society would be the media ecosystem that we can see unfolding on traditional media, but also the social media as Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and others. Uh, especially the latter part is something that we do very much uh, in, a, in a mixed method way, where we use qualitative methods developed within media studies, but also quantitative methods. We use machine learning and um, uh, NLP to, to understand what is actually said on social media. Uh, we recently built uh, a, a classifiers for detecting anti-Semitism online, just to, to give some ideas how our, our work is really oscillating between very qualitative, almost on anthropological methods and more um, data-driven quantitative methods. As I said, uh, 
we are interested in working with societal partners. So with this research areas, we also defined two main groups of societal partners we are interested in working with. Those are public management partners, mostly municipalities or uh, provinces, regional governments, and uh, we work with a number of ministries. The other range of partners are media organizations, very often public media. So I, I always like to say that we have a distinct way of approaching things. We, we call that entrepreneurial research, and that is not to be mistaken with utilizing research findings for commercial gains. It is the other way around. What we call entrepreneurial research utilizes commercial activities for conducting research. That means we go into the field and we identify in the sectors that we want to investigate a certain need. And we develop specifically for these sectors tools, instruments and services that help us to enter these areas, not merely as researchers, but as experts. And this also funds our research. So every time we develop a research project with external partners, we are also looking for an area of application that we can reuse and that always helps us to get more findings, more insights within these sectors. To us, the advantages are clear. We get privileged access and deep insight into these organizations. We understand how they work. So DIDA was mentioned in the beginning. DIDA helps us really to un understand the operational capacities of an organization, the data projects they're working on, and the frictions within the organizations of um, yeah, introducing digital uh, digitization, uh, introducing algorithms, or introducing various data projects, and how these shape or transform the organization. The other opportunity is that we create great learning opportunities for our students. Next to that theoretical training uh, within the university, they see how things unfold within society and have an opportunity to look at workplaces, to see what would be career opportunities, what is actually the data practices are used for and what challenges arise from that. And we can make an immediate impact. We, facilitate a mutual knowledge transfer between those sectors and the university. So very often we see that students disappear within the commercial world. Although they are really busy with interesting research, we would gain from a lot. But keeping in contact with them and actually connecting them to research projects helps also to uh, win this knowledge back into the academic system. And this, this work leads to really strong connections between university and societal sectors. We can see that, for instance, now with uh, new funding schemes where um, uh, societal partners are often required and additional funding from those partners is uh, required, that we find it very feasible to actually organize such projects where external partners are contributing to the research projects. This is not entirely new. Uh, and a colleague within communication studies, uh, um, uh, Lazarsfeld, together with Johara and Seiser, tried similar activities in the 30s. They wanted to investigate the impact of unemployment on a population. And that was uh, Marienthal, uh, a city not far from Vienna, that was struck by sudden major unemployment because the major textile company in that area closed down. And instead of just going there with a questionnaire and asking how are you doing as an unemployed person, they went there with a number of activities. So they uh, developed a cloth uh, clothing one, uh, collected clothes for, for the families, which gave them insight in, in what, what do they actually have in their closets? What do they need? They uh, developed enough trust that children would write down their uh, uh, wish lists for Christmas, which would gain insight into the imagination of children in, in unemployed families. They would uh, organize charity activities, provide consultation hours on health issues, on, on diet issues and so forth, and provide cultural activities. So they would do something that very often is labeled within the humanities and social sciences as giving back to the community that you investigate. But I think they did, that, that is a side effect. They did something more profound. They developed new methods of collecting data because all of this is actually collecting data. And they developed a strong trust with the population they wanted to investigate, which gave them a profound insight into 
the um, uh, uh, population. And they came up with great ideas of quantification. So one thing they did was they started to quantify how long people, how long it takes walking down the street. And they noticed that unemployed populations walk slowly, stand for a long time, uh, idle around, uh, 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 stare into the air. And so, so they came up with, with novel ways of capturing the impact of unemployment. This is how we do that. We develop a number of tools, for instance, the data ethics decision aid, but also a data ethics awareness test, where we try to quantify the awareness to data ethical issues in any organization, say a major bank, uh, a province, uh, or another government organization. Recently, we developed an impact assessment for human rights and algorithms uh, together with uh, our professor for fundamental uh, rights, uh, Janneke Gerards from, from our law faculty. And at the moment, this assessment is uh, rolled out uh, over the government organizations in the Netherlands, and we also develop trainings. So this is a lot of work that you wouldn't consider directly academic research. However, having now this impact assessment, gives us the opportunity to do um, participatory observation research on how algorithms are used and implemented in organizations. So we also provide the service of carrying out or moderating the impact assessment and join organizations that review their algorithms or make this impact assessment before implementing them, which gives us again insight into their practices, into their awareness to responsibility issues, uh, how they mitigate risks, uh, what kind of algorithms they are actually implementing, how they're planning to monitor them, uh, and so forth. So this affects also our teaching, because we can now teach professionals in developing basic digital ethical literacies for working with data practices or algorithms that are implemented in their organizations. Basically, what we did was we turned this circle around. Usually you have um, uh, applied research as a spin off, something that falls off the wagon of the basic research that we conduct. We, we turned it around. We started teaching and teaching is very often connected to the societal sectors. We also uh, we also see teaching professionals as that. So if I say teaching, it also always means students and professionals. And we carry out applied research projects within these societal sectors, which gives us insight into the urgencies that arise from the societal sector. So actually our research uh, process is turned around. We first look what lives within societal sectors, what are the questions and the pressing issues that we can find there, and that informs our research. Um, that gives a lot of opportunities for, for third revenue stream um, uh, funding, either from community engaged learning, which is uh, teaching professionals, or from uh, the joint research projects that we build with external partners. Again, this is not entirely new. Uh, there is a book written by a colleague from the computer sciences, Ben Schneiderman, who calls it the new ABC of research. And ABC stands for Applied and Basic Research Combined, where he uh, de describes this as a viable model of developing effective knowledge transfer between academia and various societal sectors. To Give, a, give an example in more detail, the data ethics decision aid is a structured dialogic process where organizations sit down and think about the data projects they're trying to implement or they're trying to develop within their organization. Uh, we, we looked at a number of ethic guidelines for algorithms and data and we noticed that they formulate rather abstract values that should be considered. Take the high-level expert group of, uh, for AI from, from the European Commission. Uh, they formulate seven key values. However, those ethic guidelines often neglect two things. They neglect that the people working with data, uh, with, with data or AI already have values. So there is professional integrity that is already present in the organizations. And the second part is they fall short in providing applicable solutions for making these core values applicable to design uh, decisions. 
And this is where our uh, uh, DIDA comes in. It is a structured process where the organization, various stakeholders speak together about the, the project they are to implement. Within government organizations, you can imagine that we would have here an older woman uh, who's usually detached from the process of developing a data project. You would have a statistician, you would have an external partner, you would have an information advisor, and they speak through the desired um, or the anticipated data project and think about what would be risks that could occur? Uh, how would we have to change our organization? They make decisions right while they do this. So post-its are uh, used to, to note action points. An action point might be uh, we need an, an inventory for all our algorithms, or they make a decision. The decision might be something like we are a public organization, hence all our algorithms should be publicly documented. And in that process, we bring people together at a table that very often do not directly cooperate or communicate about and uh, about such a data project. So the elder woman becomes visible of her personal responsibility of recognizing and making explicit the political values that might be embedded in such a project. To give you an example, uh, a project for uh, preventing poverty in a municipality that is largely social democratic looks fundamentally different from the same project in a municipality that is largely liberal dominated in, in its uh, uh, city council. So we did this not only with municipalities, but also with uh, corp corporations. And there's one big difference. In corporations, we have to make the values much more explicit because most employees enter the corporation and leave their personal values at the door and the values of the company are rarely made explicit. We do that, we ask them, make your values explicit, and then we get a fancy presentation from uh, compliance and uh, often starts with a Che Guevara quote or uh, a Mandela quote that they will change the world to the better. Uh, but we, we then have to gather with them really unearth which values they have. Uh, we had one uh, telecom company that uh, wanted to use artificial intelligence for matching call center agents with callers based on some, um, some, some, some matchmaking. For instance, uh, single parents would be matched to single parents, people from Brabant would be matched to people from Brabant. And the sales pitch of the AI company selling the software was, you can sell more stuff if you do it. So they used DIDA to, to review that and they noticed actually our call center has a, has a significant value, namely to help callers, not to sell them something but to help them with their subscription or their product or whatever. We don't want them to sell them something additional. We want that they get the help, which is the reason why they call. So they terminated the contract based on, on the outcomes of DIDA. We used, we used the, the pandemic to develop a remote version. You can see that the, the on-site version is something where you have the people in place, which is really interesting, but we, Great dynamic unfolds there. We, we are sometimes like therapists. We see uh, aspects of the organizations that uh, are not visible. However, the remote version has also advantages. We now do this also in Germany. We can do this in areas of the Netherlands where traveling to would be too time uh, uh, costly. And as it is online, we immediately make the documentation. So the partner and we have a better documented uh, outcome immediately. This is the impact assessment for human rights and algorithms that is now published within uh, uh, the, the national uh, government. Uh, this is also a, a four-step process where we uh, ask uh, basic questions of why do we want to implement an algorithm, what is the algorithm, there's a lot of uh, details, technical details to look at, and then the question how is it implemented also with an I2, uh, how do you monitor within the organization the use of an algorithm, and then the last part is a sort of benchmarking process where we uh, look at fundamental rights and how they might be affected. I don't know how am I doing time-wise, how much, yeah. So another project which we developed together with uh, our colleagues from the Rebo faculty is the Data Workplace. And the Data Workplace is uh, uh, also a project that is on the cross-section between uh, organizational studies, uh, media studies, or what we call critical data studies, or, and, and, and also the, the science faculty. We are looking at how these organizations that teamed up with us are changing through the implementation of um, all kind of uh, 
algorithmic solutions, uh, dashboards, for instance, um, uh, uh, predictive analysis, uh, digitization in, in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, the exciting thing here is you, you develop something together and you have no idea where you're actually going. So we don't have a clear research question when we begin. And that is something that is uh, um, was puzzling in the beginning. We do this now for four years. This is the fourth year this is uh, uh, working. And on the way, we developed a number of research questions, a number of pressing issues we wanted to respond to. And we noticed that the longer we work with the organization, the better the impact is. So we don't have something that we quickly start. We, we cannot promise that we give you a tool or a process that will be implemented and change this, your organization. That is for a deal, for part, is that the expectation of the external partner. So it was a learning process for us all that the longer we cooperate, the more the knowledge transfer takes place on a, on a level that it's difficult to quantify. So we see that while working with the province, they notice how they actually should rewrite their vacant positions, that they are looking for different skill sets in their employees, something that does not become apparent at the beginning of the project, but they learn it on the way. They see that they need different forms of learning. So we develop also new teaching formats, like very small classes for, for the management level of a municipality, where uh, Professor Albert Meyer or I sit down with them and speak for an hour about how digitization affects their daily work or the policy making uh, uh, in a, in a, in a long-term perspective. So in a way, this becomes a transdisciplinary consortium where we also take the knowledge of the external partners into consideration where they actively contribute to our work, which sometimes even leads to joint papers that we publish where someone from the external partner is uh, contributing to the paper. Uh, I can, if there are questions, I can go on, on on all the aspects of transdisciplinary research and uh, how to organize such projects. Uh, it is very time consuming, but it is really rich in uh, what, what we actually can do for the partners and what we learn that we get. We are pointed to completely new things that were not on our research agenda before we started this process. For instance, we, we noticed that um, there's a pressing need to help uh, our representatives, our local representatives, people in city council to understand a data project, to understand what they're voting for in a council when they decide to monitor a certain neighborhood in a city. And very often they have not the full understanding or are not fully equipped to ask the right questions towards such a project. This correlates with research from Institut Rathenau, which looked at a population of councilmen and women and came to the conclusion that it is very difficult for them to develop an informed opinion about digitization or data projects that are under consideration in a city council. So we developed a sort of, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I call it a, a cheat sheet where they can look up critical questions that they might ask. Uh, this is the concept version. We just uh, are in the process of launching uh, launching the, the definite version of um, this interactive uh, uh, cheat sheet where we develop uh, three steps. And the first step, you develop uh, information about the project. And so we help them to ask the right questions that helps to develop the basis for uh, forming an opinion. The second step is the political questions they have to ask. They do that within their own fractions, the political fractions, thinking about who are groups that are marginalized by this project, how can we mitigate risks, um, how does it fit into our desired objectives. And that helps them in step three to come to a conclusion, to, to a value-driven conclusion, which can be aligned to the coalition agreement. But we often they think all these data and digital um, uh, projects are very neutral. They think it's an IT question and someone who is professional enough to look at IT issues might solve it and gives the right solution. However, there are really political decisions at stake and political values. And that is something we want to take them responsibility for. So each party should actually have 
as they have a statement on environment, on security and safety, on uh, aging society, on education, they should have a statement on how to use digital technology and how to reconsider the values that are carried within. And these tools help them. So while doing that, that's something that really fell out of thin air for us when working in the data workplace. We noticed there is this pressing need to get them on board. And how were we pointed to that? Not only by reading the report from the Institute Rathenau, but also from the audit um, offices in various municipalities who said, our data projects get more and more complex and carry more and more political values. So we need the councilmen and women to participate in the decision making, because we as employees, as city employees, have no political mandate. But what we're actually doing is carrying out political labor. And hence, it becomes more important that we introduce councilmen and women to this kind of work and decision making. The other project I'm really fascinated about, and, and that is something that is also um, uh, carried out in cooperation with uh, this faculty. I work here with uh, uh, Mathieu uh, Brinkhuis and, uh, and, and others. Albert is, uh, is on, on, on the advisory board, uh, uh, among others. Pinar is, is there too. Uh, we were approached by um, regularity authorities, and they said we need to find ways to um, to develop oversight on the use of algorithmic systems within our respective areas of oversight. And they said we, we are less interested in a merely technical audit, which are around. We are more interested in how the developer context of an algorithm and the use context is determining the outcome of the, the algorithm. So they came up with this metaphor of the appraisal interview. They said we, we, we wanted appraisal interview that we can have with an algorithm or an algorithmic system. Or to, to say more bluntly, they want that the organizations in their sectors are having these appraisal interviews before they purchase these systems and implement them. So we're at the moment at the beginning of this. At the moment, we're busy with uh, comparing the different audits that we can find and to see to what extent they actually already take a, a, a social cultural context of algorithmic of uh, developing algorithms and implementing and using them into consideration and we're busy with developing uh, a structured way that helps the uh, regulatory authorities to uh, develop the oversight so why we're doing that and, and this is what, what brings me actually here to, to 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 this department and to this faculty we are in a in a very interesting time at the moment and I think that some some challenges that we face today uh, whether it be a pandemic whether it be warfare migration climate change or in my case digitization are challenges that we cannot uh, study in a disciplinary way but only in an inter and multidisciplinary way which uh, urges us to develop uh, more cooperation and learn each other languages so um, developing novel forms of working together, which is very time consuming because we have to learn several languages, but which is, uh, I find it at least, very enriching and very effective in developing a social impact. Uh, Jose van Dijk, uh, who's um, uh, spearheading our focus area governing the digital society, uh, said eloquently that as our world gets increasingly connected and mediatized, the input and expertise from the humanities and social science becomes essential to understanding the dynamics, ethics and pragmatics of a data fight society. And this is actually the, the, the mission that also brings me to, to this faculty and in particular to this department to build these bridges and corporations that we can address these challenges together. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid there will be a little bit of an echo, but. Uh... Okay. Is the, uh, yes, but now we need a speaker. That needs to be on um, speaker. Well, like we can, I think, hear them. And uh, let me. Someone says something. Yeah. Okay. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and I will give you the the floor. Is the sound on? 
I think the sound is on. Yes. So let me kick off with one question. How does this um, link to the, the applied data science program, oh, for example? Sorry. They oh, you. Yes. Shark is asking a question. Yes. So, Shark, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Mirko, for your nice uh, and uh, overview of your work and uh, in relationship to the Utrecht Data School with the, uh, the very intriguing combination of uh, teaching and uh, research. My question is on <clears throat> the um, the way you approach your uh, say external um, uh, part parties uh, with offering your kind of yeah is it consultancy is it a, a kind of joint teaching uh, with respect to that you are competing with other consultancies that have let's say also these uh, these means but let's say they are not supported by a, um, a governmental agency like uh, Utrecht University we did uh, namely several uh, we did similar uh, work in in some field but we got complaints through um, the um, what is it the trade uh, association that we were competing with professional educational institutes. So what is your um, vision on that? It's, it's an absolutely valid question and something we, we of course uh, deal with as well. Uh, I would argue that our work is different from what the consultants are doing. We develop a joint research projects and are not as much as um, appearing as consultants. Take our DIDA for instance. Uh, DIDA is licensed to consultants within the Netherlands. Uh, we, we just do DIDA processes that help our own research. The consultants that uh, license the DIDA from Utrecht University provide what much more. They also provide the process of um, uh, implementing and working through all the action points that are that are uh, defined during such a session. So in our case, it's really participatory observation that helps, of course, the external partner. Um, uh, and we are not competing there with the consultant, I would argue. Consultants have the opportunity to step in with the very same tool, but with a different um, uh, uh, selling proposition, which is mm. different. But, but can you then charge? Mm. Yeah, we charge uh, the, the, uh, the official rates that uh, the faculty mandates us to charge when this external yeah. that's yeah. what yeah yeah please that i do not uh, wish to uh, let's say uh, to turn your work down or but but it no. is uh, the, this has been a complex issue also in our research and and teaching how to uh, let's say involve societal partners I into our research because usually uh, the uh, immense data infrastructure and software infrastructures that uh, societal partners have in software companies or in large enterprises such as Unilever or, or uh, the Ministry of Education have, uh, that these are for us a very nice object of study, which we cannot say replicate in our uh, own faculty buildings, uh, uh, which is uh, in contrast with like a professor in chemistry or in uh, veterinary science, they have uh, all labs and and uh, and even uh, farms uh, uh, available but we don't have those uh, i find i uh, i don't feel that that your your remark is uh, talking down the way work we do I, I find it the other way around i think it's really relevant that the more the third revenue sector becomes relevant for us as an academic institution mm -hmm. it becomes more pressing that we as a university think about how to regulate it from the university side mm -hmm. uh, that we are not competing against uh, the consultants because our tariffs are, of course, different. Um, and I do this work with external partners. Really, it's driven by the research interest. It must give us the insight we want. And secondly, it must provide learning opportunities for students. And that is quite different from how the consultants approach it. Yeah, OK, thanks. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jack. Any further questions from the audience? 
I had one, uh, yes, um, about the uh, applied data science program and yeah. how that relates um, uh, to all this relates to the, the to this program. And one thing is that the applied data science program, uh, of course, tries to cooperate uh, intensively with external partners. So uh, we we have a graduation project with external partners, and have deliberately so chosen for that uh, option because it gives the students at an early age. Uh, insight into uh, later work environments or future work environments. Um, what I bring to the Applied Data Science program is for part the network that we developed within the Utrecht Data School which is with external partners and uh, to, uh, to, to build the larger network with what the colleagues here from the other faculties, five faculties involved in the Applied Data Science program, bring together to build this larger network and to connect students better to external partners. So we also have a colloquium within Applied Data Science where we do not only address the ethics part, but we also invite uh, colleagues who are already working within the very societal sectors and they tell the students about what kind of projects uh, they're working with, what you have to expect uh, what kind of careers you can have, uh, how to to choose the job that fits best to you and your your goals, because the students are of course confronted with a major range of, of offerings they, they get. They are really sought after. So the, the challenge is how can I find something that really helps me to develop further and that is a good fit because the job they will get that is out of question. Thank you very much. So um, if there are no further questions, uh, let's give a final round of applause to our speaker and then the people here, we can move on to the beer and snacks and you guys have to <laughs> uh, join us virtually, I guess. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, we can stop the recording and uh, see you all.